Hey everyone, welcome to today's podcast. We're talking about practicing being thin and healthy. You've got to practice this because if you've been struggling to lose weight, you're not very good at being thin and healthy. I know this is like a weird concept and that's weird to me because anything else in your life, don't you have to practice it to become good? But then when it comes to weight loss, people are like, well, I know what to do. I'm just going to start doing it tomorrow. Well, how? You've been sucking at making good food choices for decades, but now to, what, what's magical about tomorrow that all of a sudden you can just eat perfectly? I don't get that. So you've got to think about this. There's a good chance that if you've been struggling with your weight, that you're not very good at eating and living like a thin and healthy person. And it would be great if you could just decide to be a thin and healthy person, then just magically be a thin and healthy person tomorrow. But you probably can't. Just like I can't just decide to be a great piano player tomorrow if I've never played piano. I can decide to commit to it and start practicing so I become one. But why would it be any different with weight loss? And so the more you start to approach your weight mastery and weight loss as something that you're going to practice and get good at, it becomes a game changer. Because right now when you think, well, I know what I got to do. I just got to get myself to do it. You're thinking in this all or nothing mindset. And it's great when you're all those couple days, those couple weeks when you're all, everything's great. But the majority of the time you're doing nothing. And then you just go back and say, okay, now I'll be perfect again. But there's most of the time you're doing nothing. And so you're never practicing becoming the person you want to become. Now, this gets down to the question, how do you practice being the person you want to be? Well, again, if you don't know how to program yourself, I guess you just keep at it. But when you know how to program yourself, what ends up happening is the main practice happens in your mind. Because yes, doing the right stuff is ideal. That's what we all want to do. We all want to make the right food decisions, always make the right decision, obviously. But what happens when you don't? What do you do then? What do you do then? What do you do when you have a day where you go and eat the cookies and the pizza and all the rest of it? What do you do? How do you practice once that happens to be a thin and healthy person? Well, most people have no answer for that. And they just get blown way off course and see in a couple months when I get re-inspired again and start my plan. But in Program Yourself Thin, we use a process where we go into our mistakes and we imagine, we say, okay, man, I screwed up there. Knowing what I know now, if I go back in time, what would I have done differently? And we imagine ourselves being the person we want to be in that scenario so that we learn, we practice being the person we want to be. So again, I, I think practice is important. You can make your own decisions on it, but you're going to have to understand how are you going to become the person you want to become if you don't have an opportunity to practice becoming that person? And so I think the more you practice being the person you want to be magically, the more you become that version of yourself. And if you don't practice it, you'll probably never become that version of yourself because weight loss is no different than all the other things that you need to practice to get good at. And so the sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll start getting much, much better results. So I hope this helps you out. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them and uh, we'll get into them. Yeah, this over here. This over here. All right. This camera changes down. Good. All right. Uh, yeah. So here we are. What is it? Wednesday? This day is weird for me. Changed by the solar eclipse. I was affected by that thing. <laughs> I saw the totality too. I will tell you not to be this person because no one wants to hear that the, the person who can't stop talking about the eclipse, but there's a big difference between the totality and, uh, and even 95%. Like, I'm, I'm not trying to feel bad about it, but if you ever get a chance to, to do the extra to go see the totality, I suggest it. It was quite a, quite an experience. Erica says, felt a little sadness during hypno day two at thought of body changing, like losing a friend. Um, yeah, that's Erica. That's completely normal. So I'm glad. I like when my clients are like, oh, I feel kind of sad about this. or I feel weird, you know, not, not that I want you to feel sad and weird, but so much of what we're talking about is under the surface. You know, it, it, boy, we had a coaching call last night it was so good because there was a lot of this, this idea that there's these sub, these subtle subconscious factors that are really have more impact on your weight than anything else. And this idea, the thought of the body changing is like losing a friend. This goes back to the idea that people prefer a known hell to an unknown heaven because our mind likes to know what the hell's going on. Our brain is a status quo machine. It wants to keep everything the same because it feels like that's the best case of predicting the future and our survival. And even down to weight. Again, I know you think about weight loss 24 hours a day, but you're as much as you might not like being overweight, you've got to agree 
that you're comfortable and familiar with it. You're, you're familiar with it. And I don't mean comfortable physically or emotionally, but I mean like mentally, you know how to be an overweight person. If you've been an overweight person for years and years and years, that's how you identify. This is what you know. And so to, to move into a space where it's new, where you don't know it, where you don't have your old way of being, there is a sense of loss, as weird as that may seem. And this is the level you got to start thinking on. I mean, shit, if, if, if weight loss was just this conscious thing, oh, I know what I got to do. I just got to get myself to do it. Then you would already done it. There's obviously something more going on that you're missing. Don't you think you're not an idiot? If you're listening to me and you regularly listen, you're not dumb. You're a smart, intelligent person. I already know this. And what the, the big thing missing from your whole process here is that you're not looking at the subconscious factors impacting your weight. We can't just look at the conscious. Uh, of course you want to lose weight. You know what to do to lose weight. You know what you should do. That's not what's driving your weight. You know, and so, yeah, Erica, I, I'm glad you recognize that. So much of this process is realizing the subtle little things underneath that may not make sense to us, um, but, but really uh, honoring those things, not ignoring them, looking at them and saying, okay, yes, I do feel like I'm, I'm losing myself almost. I feel like I'm losing a friend. You are losing a friend. It's your overweight self. It's who you've been for so long. But we need to acknowledge that and say, I'm still not losing anything. I'm going to become a better version of myself. I'm still who I am. And now I'm going to be a better, happier version of who I am, a, help, a healthier, happier version of who I am. You know, and so I'm still the same person. And this loss isn't real. You know what I mean? And maybe it is for you. Again, you got to figure out what, you know, define how it is for you. But you've got to look at this, this thing, Erica, and you've got to come up with some resolution that works for you. So I'm, I'm good job. That, that's what these sessions and what this whole program is meant to do. Partly is to bring some of these things up to the surface so you can deal with them. And a lot of times the things that come to the surface don't make any logical sense. That's just part of the process. Um, Tammy says, how do you accept some food stuff and be okay with that? I find that sometimes I'm in a position to eat food stuff, but I feel bad about eating stuff that isn't real food. Um, yeah, Tammy, I get that too. I mean, that's why I'm programming yourself. Then we have clean and pleasure days. Um, it takes a lot of mental work to kind of get, um, to kind of wrap your head around a new way to eat. I've, I've really started kind of glom onto this idea that we are, we live in an alien world at this point. Do you know what I mean? It, it's literally, it's like you were born and flown to, to Mars. It, it, it's, it's an alien world. The, the biology that we've evolved to have is not the biology that lets us thrive in this environment you know, with, with the food and stuff. And so how do we navigate food stuff and food? You know, how do we get comfortable with it? I will tell you now, this is, I've been like this my whole life. And this is a real uh, benefit, I think, is I'm not a black or white thinker when it comes to substances, <laughs> to be honest. I think that, you know, some people are, and that's fine, but we all get to choose how we're going to approach things. And so I don't want to be the healthiest person I can be. I want to manage it. Where can I have the most pleasure? And what's the most pleasure? The most pleasure to me is to never eating sugar again is not the most pleasure for me. I like eating a little bit of sugar moderately. I like drinking some wine moderately. I like eating, I don't really, you know, fast food, but like, you know, I'll eat food stuff moderately. There's a sweet spot where I think I can eat it and enjoy it. And it's not harming me physically, you know? So I think that's the path you got to go down to come up with your own piece you know, and it's different for each person. What works for me isn't what may work for you. So you got to spend a little time and say, you know, why would you feel bad about eating food stuff if it's not affecting your weight or your health? And, and a moderate amount of, of pretty much anything's not going to really affect you that, that much, you know? Um, but it doesn't matter. M&Ms, chips, pizza, whatever food you may consider food stuff, a, a moderate amount of it, most people are fine with that. And that becomes the sweet spot where, Again, it's a moderate amount, so it's not affecting our weight, our health, our happiness, um, and we get to enjoy it once in a while. You know, that seems to be a sweet spot. And managing that, yeah, it's um, it's a challenge. That's why we do the clean, the clean pleasure days and program yourself then, which is a lot of psychology in that because most dieters have the shittiest relationship with food imaginable, and so, um, you know, the, the clean pleasure days are a way to create a healthier relationship with food. So, and kind of deal with that question, but that's a good question. You know, it's common for everyone. Um, Eric says, how do you want something so badly yet also feel a little bit sad when it finally starts happening? Yeah. Change is scary. You, you know, that, that, that's what happens. Change is scary. Even if it's good change. Uh, again, this isn't a consciously, this makes no sense. We're not conscious creatures, folks. 
we're, we're partly conscious, but we're primarily subconscious. And so we have a brain that wants to maintain the status quo, even if that status quo is uncomfortable. This happens with money, relationships, weight for sure. You know, you, you think about losing weight all day long, but at the same time, you know how to live as an overweight person. You know how to relate to people as an overweight person. You know how to get by in the world as an overweight person. And so now all of a sudden become a thin, healthy person. It's like you're stepping into a new identity and it's weird. It feels weird. And I don't know what fucking no one thinks about. It just, I'm in a mood today. I'll tell you, I'll be honest already, but it's just, it's like when it comes to weight, it's like, I don't know how an entire culture doesn't think any deeper than just scratch the fucking surface of weight loss. It's, it's just, I don't get it. I don't get how we can just be like, well, I just got to cut calories. That's what I got to do. You don't think there's any emotional stuff involved with your weight and your eating. You don't think there's any mindset stuff involved with it. Like, like what? How can we be so educated as a society? And again, even my clients, and I know if you're watching this, I know you're like a super smart person. And it's just like, that is the power of hypnosis. Cause you've been hypnotized to think like a dieter and it, it's weird and it's unnatural, you know, to just co completely miss the most obvious shit. But anyways, again, Eric, I wish I could give you a more satisfying answer, but, but the, the answer I come up with, cause this is very common is that there is a feeling of loss. There's a feeling of loss, how I used to be and how I'm going to be. And there will be a feeling of loss, as weird as that may seem. For some people, not everyone, but it's a very common thing that people, as they start to lose weight, they feel a sense of loss because you're leaving behind how you were and stepping into who you want to be. Which, by the way, in Program Yourself Thin is why we identify the self-image piece. It's the second part of the program. Right after we get through motivation, we get to the, the self-image. And if you don't know what a self-image is and what your identity is and how your self-image is impacting you, I mean, good luck. I, I don't even know what to tell you. You know, it's just like, it, it, I don't know. I don't, Cause this is the stuff that comes up. This is the stuff that comes up. What she's saying is not unusual. And I don't know if you all, you've all lost weight before. Why do you think you put the weight back on? I always love, it's one of my favorite questions in the world. Why do you think with the weight back? I couldn't stick to the plan. Really? You followed the plan to get to your goal weight. So what do you think happened? Once you got to your goal weight, the weight started going, why, why do you think it happened there? You know, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the big ones is that you don't feel like yourself. I've done over 6,000, almost 6,000 private weight loss sessions at this point. And I've asked every person I've ever worked with, why'd you put the weight back on? Because everyone's lost weight before. Well, why'd you put it back on? It always comes down to the, some form of the same answer. I didn't feel like myself. So, you know, part of this process of losing weight is a transformation of your identity, how you think about yourself. And that's, it's a more challenging part. It's, it's easy to deal with once you recognize it. But if you don't recognize it, you start to have these feelings of sadness. You start losing, the scale goes down and you start to feel sad. You start to really wrap your head around, geez, this could really be my new reality. I could be a thin, healthy person. And you start to feel sad and worried. Doesn't make logical sense, but it's real. And if you don't know how to deal with it or identify it, it can sabotage you. You know, but yeah, those are good questions, Erica, but that's what you're working through. Okay. That that's what you're working through during this process, you know, for sure. It's just stuff that we, we don't usually think about. So it feels weird, but it, you know, it's just cause you never think about it. What's up, Jody? Amazing coaching call last night. Really got me thinking. Yeah, it really was a good one last night. It, it was some, some are real outliers. And last night was a really great, 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 great one. Enjoyed that very much. Um, Deanna says, could part of the sense of loss be because of the lifestyle you might be leaving behind, like maybe your friends or social stuff? Yeah, I think that's part of it too. Absolutely. You know, I was talking about that yesterday, like the effect that your weight loss and health path have on your relationships that are closest to you. Uh, it does. It affects a lot of things. Again, it's not, I'm just going to eat less. <laughs> yeah. God, it, it's just, that's what a, what a superficial way to look at these. So, so like one dimensional, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And so, yeah, for different people, it's going to be different stuff. So again, that's why I say, I don't just say like, oh, when you start losing weight, you're going to be sad because the, it's not like that. It shows up differently for different people. So for you, Deanna, it might be more, oh, my lifestyle is going to change. It was for me. I remember that. I And, and you go through phases of that. I remember um, when I first started this, it was very weird because like I was really, like a partier, you know what I mean? Like, so a lot of my, my social group for years had been partying. That's what we did. And so as I started to step in this reality, there's absolutely a sense of loss of identity. But then the biggest thing at the moment was the sense of friend group, 
I'm not, how am I going to hang out with these people? I don't want to go out and do this anymore. This isn't what I want to do. And there's a feeling of loss of that. Well, what do I do now? Right? There's a vacuum to some degree. You got to fill that vacuum in. That's the key part. But absolutely. So loss of friends, loss of lifestyle, loss of routine, loss of identity. All of these things are real. You know, and there's more things than just that. So again, we, we definitely want to recognize those things. Um, yeah, super helpful to know that was normal. I think I'll start journaling those feelings. Yeah, absolutely. Journaling is a great way to deal with it. And um, th the main thing is, again, just being aware of it and not ignoring it, not judging yourself. Because a lot of times we do that. We're like, we feel sad. We're losing weight and we feel sad. And our conscious mind says, don't oh, stop. Just who cares? It's silly to feel sad. We, we, we basically... Um, we, a lot of times we don't, we don't honor ourselves. So we feel sad and we don't explore that feeling or acknowledge it. We just ignore it. That doesn't make any sense. We do it all the time to ourselves and you do it at your own peril because a lot of these things that are coming up, you need to resolve, you need to face them and deal with them. And it, it's usually, it's, it's, it's not that hard to deal with them. I've noticed it's not so hard to deal with the stuff that comes up. Um, but our tendency is that we kind of just ignore them or nah, that's stupid. You know, and then that, that that doesn't deal with it. And then it kind of just rots from kind of the inside. So we got to acknowledge and deal with these things. Uh, Kellen says, hello, brother. Hello. Um, CJ, I had gastric bypass at 19. I'm 50 now. I've been on GLP-1 and I've lost over 70 pounds. Um, great. Yeah, yeah. Had a gastric bypass at 19. Wow. I'm 50 now. You know, that just goes to, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, but again, the, the gastric bypass is not, you know, a forever solution. Um, the GLP one, maybe it will be too. I hope it is for you, you know, so I wish you the best with it. Um, but you know, I, I always say, so, again, I, I'm not against, I, I'm not sitting here. I'm here to be supportive. So if someone's using gastric bypasses, sleeves, GLP one hormone, you know, increasers, uh, I can still help you. I have people in the program that are on the you know, medicines and in these situations, but I think what it, what it usually comes down to is, typically those those solutions are not permanent solutions and they don't deal with the core problem you know typically and so sometimes they do sometimes they don't but what i'm talking about is really weight mastery and it's a comprehensive holistic approach to mastering your weight and um you know the medicine and the sleeves they never deal with the core problems how to deal with your emotions how to shift your mindset how to deal with your new thin healthy self-image how to you know, influence your habits so that they are working for you, how to change your thinking, how to maintain and stay on the path, you know, long-term. So these things you never learn, you never learn how to, you know, create a lifestyle that supports your weight and your health. Um, so again, I have nothing against the, the medicines and the gastric sleeves and all that stuff. Um, but they're outside solutions trying to, you know, they, they deal with the symptoms typically. They're not long-term permanent fixes. It, it, you're not mastering your way through those strategies. So I'm happy for the 70 pounds, but again, in, in this context, you know, it, it's not a permanent solution and which is fine. You know, again, if you want to take the medicine forever, maybe it will be. Um, but for a lot of people I work with, you know, they, they want that permanent solution. Um, Sophie says, I just found out I have high cholesterol. I'm so scared. Uh, yeah. High cholesterol is scary. I had high cholesterol. I have familial high cholesterol. I'm on a statin. Um, but yeah, I am practically a vegan and my cholesterol was over 250. So, you know, my father died of a heart attack at 54. So that was, that scared the shit out of me because, you know, I talk about this every day, but my, my main motivation to really master my weight and my health is to live longer. <laughs> and, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go down the path my dad did. Um, it's the scariest thing in the world. So when I got that high cholesterol, which I got like 10 years ago that when I, mean, I was like, holy shit, I was shocked by that. And I spent 10 years trying all kinds of different things to get it down naturally, and I couldn't do it. And I wish I knew what I know now about cholesterol and statins. I would have taken the statins earlier and I wish I had done that, but whatever. So I take them now and my, my own cholesterol is really low and I'm very happy about that. Um, but cholesterol and statin, that's a whole thing too. And so, you know, again, don't get upset with me if you don't agree with me. Um, great minds, you know, can, can disagree. Um, but I will tell you what I've learned through my cholesterol travels. Cause I, the second I got diagnosed with cholesterol, and I'm conspiracy, conspiracy brained to some degree anyways, as you, you may know if you listen to me at all. Um, but as soon as I get diagnosed with cholesterol, I started on the path, okay. And very quickly, you, you kind of hit this fork in the road. Is cholesterol bad and we can treat it or it's just fine? You know what I mean? And you start going on these paths and you start, you can go down each path, every path you want. And I say this because 
this is the reality we live in now. It's the information age and you can go down whatever paths you want. You can think eating just straight meat for the rest of your life is the healthiest thing in the world. Or you could think, you know, just being a vegan is the healthiest thing in the world. And you got all the science and all the people backing it up. And so it's a scary time in that sense. And I consider myself very, very fortunate that I uh, learned what I learned about cholesterol and, uh, and and I'm on the path I'm on now. So everyone gets to make their own decisions. Uh, and so Sophie, hopefully for you, it's a, it's a diet thing, you know, for, for most people, they change their diet and they can lower their cholesterol dramatically. Uh, I was not one of those people, you know, so, so I hope you take it seriously, which is just another point I'm always trying to make that wanting to, wanting to look better is not enough motivation. Okay. And I don't give a shit. I don't care. Let, let's argue about it. Cause I, I can't tell you the number of arguments I've had with people where they're like, no, I really want to lose. I really want to look better. And it's like, well, that's not enough motivation. Yeah, Jim, I really want to look better. Well, how fucking long you wanted to look better for? 10 years. How's your weight loss been? I haven't lost any. That's because you're not motivated, all right? The real motivation you need to really make this happen really comes from wanting to live longer, wanting to have the best quality of life you can have while you're alive and want to look better, okay? In that fucking order. And it's not going to work unless you're like a model or you make your money off of looking a certain way, perhaps, but, but if that's not you, if you're a 60 year old grandmother, you wanting to wear a bathing suit to the beach, I promise you is not going to be enough motivation to lose weight. And so Sophie, I know you're scared, but that scared, that fear, you can kind of bottle that to be motivation to, to get the results you want to get. And what I will tell you is if you have not yet go to my bio, click the link, get the hypnosis session. I give you get on my email list. Cause I give you access to a, a free program. It's called the spark program. And one of the things I give you in that program is the 15 minute motivation challenge. And I can kind of piggyback on your high cholesterol reading uh, and help you kind of bottle that and use that as motivation to, to clean up your reading. And hopefully that'll help you with the cholesterol as well. Um, what's up, Haley? How's it going? Evening. Where, where are you at? For me, it's the middle of the day. Looks like it's going to rain though in a minute. What's up, Karen? Um, and Karen, I got your, your message yesterday. I'll, I'll send you a thing back. Um, Sophie says, would you recommend going on semaglutide to lose weight? Um, I absolutely would not. <laughs> I would not. Uh, I think, you know, listen, I'm not against medicine. As I just said, I'm on a statin. I'll be on a statin for the rest of my life. So I'm not against medicine. Uh, what I find with the semaglutide, what's it do to you? It increases your GLP-1 hormone. Okay. When your GLP-1 hormone's higher, it signals your body that you're more satiated. You're fuller. So you end up eating less food. You end up eating less often. You feel fuller longer. Um, but is there any other way to create a higher level of GLP one in your body? Absolutely. Uh, eating more fibers, number one, number one way to increase more GLP one hormone in your body is to eat more fiber in the forms of fruits, vegetables, greens, beans, um, higher quality fats, higher quality proteins, more natural whole foods, basically, but fibers at the top of the list. And so you can look this up and see it anywhere, you know, you go research it. And you will not hear Oprah talk about that. You will not hear the doctor she invites on talking about that, um, but it's true. And why does that happen? Because we're meant to eat natural whole foods. We're, at, we're meant to eat lots and lots of fiber. Fiber is the number one thing stripped out of our diets in America. And it's probably one of the main reasons why you're hungry all the time. So, you know, if you don't wanna change your diet and you wanna keep eating the same processed bullshit food, then I would suggest taking semaglutide if you wanna lose weight. But if you want to actually master this area of your life, I would try that first and then see how you feel. And if you don't feel any different, you know what I mean? You, you start, you boost your fiber intake up tremendously for a month and you don't feel any different, then you go knock yourself out with that. But I bet you feel considerably different. I know I did. I didn't realize what was going on five, six years ago when I started adding salads for lunch, giant nutrient dense and variety salads to lunch with tons of fiber in it. I didn't realize what was going on then, but I started eating that and I could not believe how much more full and satisfied I felt. So I think that, um, you know, again, it's medicine and you're not going to get the full picture from them because they want to sell you medicine. But I think that, you know, it, it's not a secret that you can increase your GLP one in natural ways. Um, but it's up to every person to do what they want to do, you know? So I, I, it would not be my recommendation, but everyone gets to do what they want to do. Um, any tips, advice to come out of a binge eating cycle? Uh, yeah, I think the secret to come out of a binge eating cycle is to go back to five minutes before you, what's before you started the binge eating cycle and pay attention to what was going on. Where were you at hunger wise? Where were you at emotionally? 
And where were you at habitually? I guess those are the big three I would focus on. Were you really hungry? Were you emotionally in a real weird place? Um, or is this just a habit? Like every Friday at noon, I start binging. You know, we want to understand the binge cycle first. We don't want to just stop it. We want to seek to understand it because the more you understand it, the more you can come up with a strategic solution to resolve it. So I would start there. That, that's kind of the, the first thing I would start with. Um, Haley says it's all about the emotional mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Absolutely. Um, Jody says, with the program, I've been free to enjoy a lifestyle with others and not stress about food. Yeah, exactly. Jody, it, yeah, talks about it all the time because it's not, you know, I don't know. It's funny. I was talking last night on the coaching call. Um, we have a client and she, she's already a master of her weight. She masters it 15 pounds over, <laughs> which a lot of my clients do that maybe you, you know, uh, I would say 20, 30% of my clients are people within 10 pounds of their goal weight, but they've been within 10 pounds of their goal weight for the last 20 years. Right. And uh, one of the reasons they do this is because they don't know how to live as a thin, healthy person. So they kind of keep themselves just above their goal weight so they can stay in diet mode. Cause that's the only way they can feel in control. Um, but as we go deeper into, it's always the same way with everyone, but with th this particular client who does that, uh, it turns out that it's really not about the weight. There's a whole other issue that was at play. And so a lot of what program self is about is kind of bringing these subconscious issues to the surface so we can resolve them. And again, it's always, I mean, it's kind of just like, I've always gotten used to it at this point, but it's, it's always interesting when I get to work with very, very smart, intelligent people. Right. I, I always I try to point this out to you because I want I want you to understand this. I know a lot of dieters are really hard on themselves and they feel like something's wrong with them. And I always try and reinforce and remind you, you know, I work with extremely successful people in my group program. They're all very intelligent, smart, you know, type A driven people typically. Uh, and in my private coaching, I work with absolute outlier successful people. It's 25 grand to work with me privately. So I work with extreme outlier um, successful people. A lot of them run very, very successful businesses. Um, you know, movie stars, you know, celebrities, uh, people that you might even know that you would look at and you say, holy shit, that, that's a real, let me, but I said, Oprah is always kind of the, the fill in for this Oprah. I mean, how much more willpower, success, ambition do you need intelligence, right? She's got it all, but she can't control her weight. So it's not about what you're even working with. It's about what you've learned as well. And you have never been exposed to a comprehensive holistic system to master your weight. And any comprehensive holistic system to master your weight has got to include some emotional peace, right? How to deal with your emotions, how to feel the emotions you want to feel consistently, regularly. How can you do that without food? And how do you deal with the shitty emotions life brings you without relying on food? And I would say that's one of the core things that most people have no idea how to deal with. And so how are you ever going to master your weight? What's up, Lorena? How's it going? Thanks for that, Rose. Um, so you got to deal with the deeper issues in my world. I don't think there's, it's not a knowledge problem is what I'm trying to say. It's not a knowledge problem is keeping you overweight. It's not a willpower problem. It's a lack of strategy. It's a lack of a comprehensive holistic system to master your weight. You have no clue what it is. And your chances of figuring it out on your own are very low, to be honest. I've spent 30 years creating this. What's up, Jason? How old are you? I am 49. Uh, from the start, Cree says, from the start, should I not make my calorie intake too low? I'm worried my maintenance will get low. Um, I mean, again, I'm going to throw this out there and I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a, a you know, um, a, a biogenic thermal expert. So take it or leave it. But, but I've worked with, uh, I've done almost 6,000 private weight loss sessions and I help people lose weight for good. And I do it through kind of common sense approaches, but here we go. A lot of times when people approach weight loss, what they're doing is they you got your average calorie consumption and what people are doing on a diet is they're drastically creating a drastic calorie deficit, oftentimes over 50%. So they're going from 2,500 calories a day to 1200 calories a day, a thousand calories a day. And so it's that idea because you want to lose weight quickly. Okay. So you drastically cut these calories out and then you have this idea that you're going to bring it back up to maintenance that rarely works. Okay. It's estimated that 95% of people that lose weight, put it back on. So I, I would not follow what the fucking 95% of people that fail do. Is that a crazy idea? If, if, if everyone's failing doing something, wouldn't it make sense to do something different? So I think Creedy, you're absolutely right that you should be nervous about going too low. 
And so instead, here's what I go, take this or leave it. Maybe I'm totally full of shit and I have no idea what I'm talking about. But how about you start with your average calorie consumption? And let's say your average calorie consumption has you weighing 200 pounds. And let's say your goal is you want to weigh 150 pounds. So you want to drop 50 pounds. 50 pounds of 200 pounds is 25%. So instead of cutting 60, 50, 70% of your calories down, why not cut 25% of your calories down? And then stick with it for a little while and see what happens to your weight. Stick with that until the weight loss stops for a month or so. And who knows, maybe that 25% cut over the next three months, six months will bring you down to 150 pounds. Then you don't got to worry about maintenance, figuring that out. You don't have to worry about going too low or whatever else because you started going right to your maintenance right from the beginning. That's what I always suggest to people and it seems to work pretty well. Faith says, live is not working, very choppy. Oh, really? Usually I get a warning when things go. It might be your connection. I don't know. Lorena, I'm doing good. How are you doing? It's a long time no see. I'm glad you're back here. Um, I gained two kilograms lately, but trying to analyze it and try to learn from that. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, weight gain is really not a big deal, folks. Jesus Christ. It's like, you know, people gain some weight and they just lose their minds completely. It, you know, it, it's, and again, it just goes, I just made a video on this. I'm like, you just take these wild, wild swings at your weight loss. It's just like, there's no commitment. There's no strategy. There's no plan. It's just like, okay, tomorrow I do my keto plan. Tomorrow we ride. Oh my God. Fuck, for the 50th time, for the hundredth time, it doesn't work. How about you commit to it? How about you commit to your weight mastery like you do to go to college? And you have a time period that's appropriate. You have a strategy that's appropriate. The idea that you're going to completely change your eating starting tomorrow and just keep that up. You're going to completely change your eating for the next six months. No, you're not. You're the same person who struggled to eat well is just now just magically going to eat completely different starting tomorrow. I, I mean, I, I just don't get it, you know? So anyways, Lorena, great job. Yeah, you're learning from it. It's not a big deal. You put a couple pounds on it it's because you didn't put a couple pounds on anyways. You know, we had someone yesterday that said that. They're like, I've been water fasting for a couple of days and I lost six kilograms, but I can't keep the weight off. You can keep the weight off. You can't keep drinking fucking water. Do you know what I mean? Like, so again, you, you gain two kilograms because you started eating more food and you don't realize it, or you do realize it and you couldn't stop yourself, you know? So again, the weight gain is not the end of the world. It's about what's going on here. Oh, look, I started snacking a little more there. I started overeating a little more dinner. I got to I want to change that. You know, it's not the end of the world, but it's like dieters are so all or nothing that it's like they're a hundred percent in and then they're a hundred percent out. It's like the hokey pokey without the halfway in. <laughs> Right. You know what I mean? With the hokey pokey, you put, you put one arm in, you put one arm out. Dieters, they put everything in. Dieters don't have time for hokey pokey in. They got to put my whole body in, my whole body out. You know what I mean? That, that's a diet philosophy and it's, it's stupid. And so I don't care. I'm, I'm tired of, I'm tired of, of skirting around the edges. It's just, it's dumb. I'm just going to state it like it is. And if you don't think that, let's talk about it. Joy says, is a stationary bike good for exercise? Would it be enough? Um, listen, Joy, if you're not exercising at all now, a stationary bike would be better than what you're doing. So don't worry about enough. Just worry about better. Program yourself. Then we follow the 1% better a day philosophy because the fucking 100% day better. <laughs> the, I'm going to get hundred percent better tomorrow. Start tomorrow is, is so stupid that I, I, I can't hide it anymore. And I'm not going to, I just can't do it anymore. You know, so yes, Joy, a stationary bike. If you have not been exercising at all, and now you start riding a stationary bike, that's an increase in exercise and movement, and that's good. And so will it be enough? I don't know. It's better. It's better than what you've been doing. Don't worry about enough. Worry about better. Just keep getting better. That's how we get better, folks. We get 1%. We get a little bit better consistently, and we build on that, and then we get a little bit better. We get, we keep building on it. Is it not like that in everything in your life that you stuck with and actually gotten better with? Isn't it always the same story that you stick with it and you get a little better? You stick with it, you get a little better. You stick with it, you get a little better. Is there any other time in your life where you just magically one day decided you're going to get great at something and then the next day you got great at it? Like, is there any, if, give me any example. Cause I struggle. I think about this every day. I'm like, is there anything else other than dieting where you think, cause tomorrow's Monday, you're going to magically do it. Perfect. I, I don't know. Is there anything else like that? 
I don't think so. So yeah, Joy, I would think, um, I would say the stationary bike would be a great place to start. And again, is it enough? Who gives a shit? It's better. That's all that, that matters. If you orient around better, you'll be amazed at where you're at a year from now. It, it's absolutely game changing. Um, Casey says, what do I do for PCOS weight loss? Um, you do the same thing everyone else does. You reduce your calorie intake. And so I have clients on, with PCOS. And so it's not the end of the world. Your weight loss may be a little bit slower. I'm not going to argue that. Um, but it all comes down to reducing your calorie intake over time. And when you got a physical issue, PCOS, Hashimoto's, thyroid issues, insulin resistance, um, you know, menopause, hormonal stuff, when you have physical issues, I think it's extra important that you really focus on the lifestyle piece. The lifestyle piece in order of importance is proper sleep, hydration, relaxation, breathing, nourishment, movement, meditation, gratitude. As you start weaving these things into your life, they positively affect your, your biology and your physical situation in a positive way, in the same way that you know some of the other issues are affecting you negatively. And a lot of times that'll overcome or at least kind of mitigate, you know, some of the ch physical challenges you're dealing with because literally sleep, hydration, relaxation, breathing, nourishment, movement, meditation, gratitude, change your biochemistry. They have literal actual physical impacts on your body. Your sleep affects your insulin resistance. You know what I mean? Like, so all of these things combined transform your body into an optimal state of, of being. And so, you know, I would do that and then I would work on reducing my calorie consumption. And, and even with PCOS, you will lose weight. Um, Haley says, how do we not realize we are gaining weight after a loss until we are fat again? <laughs> well, because that's called denial, right? That, that's denial. And, and it's very easy for humans to be in denial. Okay. We do this constantly. You know, your brain is constantly deleting, distorting, and generalizing your reality. You don't live in reality, folks. You live in your reality. That's what program yourself is all about. And so I'll give you this example. You close one eye and look at your nose, you see it. Close the other eye, look at your nose, you see it. Open both eyes your brain deletes your nose. There's no point in seeing your nose all day. Okay. And so when we lost a bunch of weight and then we start putting it on, we get in such an emotional sensitive spot that we basically don't pay attention to the weight gain. And this is how everyone does it. And everyone does it. It's 95%, you know, of people that lose weight, put it back on. So yeah, we, we just go into a denial mode. Uh, Jody says not choppy here. Yeah. I think that's the other person's on Wi-Fi. Um, John says, been off the rails, but figured something out. See you later today. Can't wait to talk about that. I love when my clients are doing well for a few months and then get off the rails. It's my favorite thing because I know there's a big insight coming and I will gladly trade a couple pounds, getting off the rails for a little bit to have a big insight. You know, that's what we're doing and program yourself. Then we're stacking insights and strategies together. The only thing between you right now and your goal weight is the amount of strategies you have accessible to you, you know, and I will tell you right now, if you're a typical dieter, you got no, you got no good strategies. Okay. You really don't. You got tactics. All the diets are tactics. They're just all different tactics to reduce your calorie consumption and very little strategy for how to make that happen consistently. So I can't wait to talk about it, John though. Um, Lorena, definitely. I have, I feel changes. Like I feel better in my body and started to make more steps three weeks ago. And I don't say cheat meal anymore. I say pleasure meal. Super Lorena. I, I love that. The, the pleasure, the pleasure meal, like, you know, it took me a little while to kind of come up with that. And now I'm 100% in on the pleasure days, even to the point that I kind of, everyone can do what they want to do. You know, even clients I work with, you know, everyone gets to choose their own path. Uh, I certainly, you know, fight for best practices, you know, even when people don't feel like they're going to work for them. But pleasure days, I think is, is really turning out to be a really important word. Um, cause what do people do? Cheat days, cheat days, a horrible phrase, right? I always joke, you call them adultery days. What are you cheating on? It's a shitty feeling. You want to be a cheater? Is that what you want to be? Does that make you feel good to be a be cheat meals, cheat days? You feel good about that word, right? Binge days. Well, obviously that doesn't feel good. Oh, free days. What free days? What just eat everything? No pleasure days. Oh, I'm got all the pleasure. Yeah. Well, what's the most pleasure? Let's get to it. I love this because I think one of the core things for most dieters, they don't know how to eat for pleasure. You know, you think eating for pleasure is eating as much as possible because you've been trained to think that way. Now, some of that's biological, some it's conditioning, but it's bullshit. Eating as much as you possibly can put into your body is not the, the path to most pleasure. No way. The most pleasure I can feel eating food is when I'm eating at my goal weight. 
eating it moderately, eating in control. So I finish eating that food. And I still feel good about myself. You can't discount the fucking consequence phase of eating, right? People do it all the time, but what, I mean, what are we doing? You don't do that in other area of life. You just do a bunch of drugs. <laughs> well, it felt good when I was doing them. Yeah, what about the consequence? Right? And we pay attention to the consequence with everything else in life. Like going on a shopping binge. That's fun. Well, no, because then I got to pay it. You know what I mean? So it's like, when it comes to the food, it's like, oh, pleasure is just when I'm eating it. Just, just when I'm eating it. That, that's how I define food pleasure. Well, what about the consequence the next 24 hours? How are you feeling physically, mentally, emotionally? How do you feel when you eat a bunch of food? Do you feel good about yourself? Is that pleasurable? Are we, does that count? Are we just doing it? Oh, that doesn't, that part doesn't count. It's just the eating part. So again, that's a mindset thing. How are you thinking about it? You know? So yeah, pleasure meals. I go right for it. Go right to the fucking heart of it because it's like you don't not eat for pleasure because you associate pleasure with overeating, and overeating is not pleasurable. Do you think it is? I know it feels that way to you, but that's because you're always taught to restrict. The diets, man. The diets are just like you know, the diets guys got you lost. You know, they've literally hypnotized you. I always joke about this. You know, people say, oh, I don't know if I can be hypnotized. Are you a dieter? Yep. You've been hypnotized. There's no greater. Well, there is probably, but one of the greatest hypnosis trances on the planet is a dieter. Because think about it. Dieting. Why the fuck are you dieting? It, it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for anyone you know. It's never worked for you. And yet you keep trying it. Talk about hypnotic phenomena. I mean, there's no, every hypnotic phenomena is exhibited with dieters amnesia don't you remember the last time you did the keto plan what happened <laughs> you know what i mean like it's just crazy but anyways great job Lorena. it's all about reflecting so you're reflecting that makes me happy <laughs> Haley says truth bob <laughs> it is truth it's truth a truthy mood today uh Lorena says i gained but progress is that i drink water instead of soda when going out and a couple times i've chose salad only times when I, instead of water i drink something else i enjoy getting healthier every week Lorena. You're making me very happy with what you're writing. And that proves to me that things are changing. What you just said, that's what I'm always looking for. I gain, but progress is that I drink water instead of soda when going out. That's what I mean. That's the difference between strategy and dieting, right? Because dieting is, okay, I'm drinking water. I'm eating salads. I'm cutting my calories. I'm exercising every day. I'm going to bed early. And you do it for five days. And then the sixth day, you don't do any of those things. You see? Now, Lorena here is working on strategies. And so she's implementing a real strategy. It's long-term. She's eating more, so she puts some weight on, but she's changed her drinking water instead of soda strategy, and that's maintaining. Super. Now we get back to the food, but now she's got, she's building up a foundation of strategies underneath her that are going to stay with her, whether she put weight on or not. That's what you need. That's how you need to start thinking, dieters, because your all-or-nothing diet mindset is never going to work for you long-term. I mean, yeah, you could lose weight for a little while and then put it all back on. If that's your goal, knock yourself out with the diets. But great job, Lorena. Um, Gail says, you make it real. I think I've had so many excuses and wrong planning. Yeah, Gail, great job. Exactly. You know, I'm not here to be an asshole. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a nice person. I like people. I don't like doing anything that makes people feel bad. I just, but at the same time, when it comes to weight loss, it's just, a, it, <laughs> I keep my language a little bit cleaner. Um, it's just a, I'm trying to think of the right word of the one I want to use, but I, I got to have some boundaries of what I'm going to be saying on these things. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking of a different phrase than what I'm thinking. But anyways, the diet industry is always bullshitting you. And um, yeah, it, it, you do have a lot of excuses, but here's, I will say this, right? I always tell my clients, there's excuses and there's reasons. You should make a distinction because there are real reasons too. Okay. But there's also a lot of excuses. The difference being excuses are things you've been saying for a long time. Reasons are usually more acute. Like, let's go on went on vacation. Vacation is a real reason. Um, I just moved. I lost a job. I got sick. Uh, you know, these things here, these are real reasons. So don't lump everything into the excuse category or you blur it. I'll make it meaningless. There are excuses that you've been using for a long time. And there's also reasons make that distinction. It's going to be very helpful. Um, but yeah, wrong planning is exactly where it's at. Uh, any diet, anyone struggling with their weight. Now, again, I'm not, I don't know. Is there a magical person out there that can change their eating and lifestyle and not lose weight? I mean, anything's possible, I suppose. 
I've never found that person. I've, I've been doing this for 20 years professionally. I've never worked with someone who's not lost weight. Now, whether they maintain it or not is another story. I'll, I'll be free to admit that um, because it does take a commitment and, you know, th there's different people. Um, but if you change your eating and lifestyle, you're going to lose weight. And I say that very bluntly because I know a lot of people out here thinking, well, oh, I got hormone stuff. So even if I cut down the, the calories, I can't lose weight no matter what I do. Uh, that's a powerless thought that's not true as far as I can tell. It's probably not true for you either because I would just dig into what you do and within seconds, because I can't tell you the number of people that come in to the program and start start that stuff. I don't know, Joe. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm doing everything perfect. I'm not losing weight. And within about 10 seconds, no, you weren't doing everything perfect at all. I've never seen anyone doing everything perfect who's not losing weight. So take it for what it is, you know, but if I talk about it, let's do it. <laughs> uh, what's up, Kathleen? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, it's a funny week. I'm in a funny week because we had the, the eclipse on Monday and then I'm going away Saturday. And so I'm kind of like that in between vacation mode a little bit and uh, kind of fun, kind of fun. Um, Karen says you're on fire today. I love it. I, I'm kind of fired up. I don't know. Maybe it's this whole week. I don't know. The eclipse. Flip something in my brain, maybe. I don't know. Uh, 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 yeah, Kathleen's, I think we just block it out. I know I do when I overeat. Yeah, I did it too. I did. I told you this, right? I, I dropped 50, over 50 pounds and I maintained the same weight for 30 years. But 12 years ago, I had a, a little blip. I put 25 pounds on and I put it on quick too. You know what I mean? So any of those people are like, oh, you're just naturally thin. Fuck you. I started eating like shit and I was put 25 pounds on in like five, six months. So it's like, give me a break. Th this idea that, oh, they can eat whatever they want. Uh, it's rarely like that. You know, it's rarely like that. It's, um, you know, I don't know. It's, I don't see that. I see people's weight being pretty, uh, you know, relative to how they're eating and living, uh, you know? So anyways, but during that, those six months, um, yeah, I, I was like, it was a tough time. So those are speaking of excuses and reasons. I will say they were reasons. Uh, they were real. We moved into a house. We redid the whole thing. Um, I run a business and I had a kid who, who was born and my babe, my son was born and he's a shitty sleeper. So I was exhausted and it was hard. I then two kids on top of it. So there was just a lot of, uh, energy expenditure, stress, you know, challenges. And my eating, I knew my eating was getting worse. I knew that. And it was the same thing. I'm like, oh, I'll be all right. All right. And so I, of course, I avoided the scale. You know what I mean? During that time. So, you know, again, the power denial is very strong. And so I remember, because I went to the doctors. That's when I went. I went to the doctor. I stepped on the scale. I was like, holy shit. Put 25 pounds on. I was like, well, unacceptable. I took 15 pounds off, um, but I did raise my goal weight. And that's always a story I like to tell because no one ever, eh, most people have no idea I've been choosing the right goal weight. But your goal weight, it can't just be this number in a vacuum. Like, oh, I want to weigh what I weigh when I was 18. Well, are you willing to live and eat that way? No. Then change your fucking goal because it doesn't make any sense to set a goal you're not willing to do the work to achieve. And I see a lot of people walking around like that. You know, like, oh, I want to weigh this. Are you willing to eat? And live? Well, I don't want to live and eat that way. But then change your goal or just suffer the consequences. I don't know. Uh, Deanna says, can you talk about how you see the semaglutide different from the statin? It's so confusing. Some docs say it's fine to be on forever like statins, but it seems different to me. Um, I mean, I don't know enough about semaglutides, uh, and I don't think anyone really knows the long-term effects of, of what that's going to be. It's relatively new, relatively new. It's been around for a long time in the type two diabetic world, but it's, it's new in terms of just giving it to everyone now. Okay. And so I don't know how much studies they've done with semaglutides in not to type two diabetic people. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, statins are the most studied medicine on the planet and they've been studied for 50, 60 years. So I feel comfortable, uh, taking a statin for the rest of my life. You know, I know people say, Oh, you can muscle pains. Well, I didn't have any of that. Okay. So I feel pretty confident and comfortable taking that medicine. Now I don't like taking medicines. Again, I spent 10 years trying to get my cholesterol down naturally. Like one year, and again, I'm practically a vegan. One year I completely stopped eating eggs. Uh, you know, like I did all sorts of stuff to try and work on it. I tried different like potions, you know, that was, I forget this, the thing it was called, um, oh man, Amblia or something. I forget the name of the stuff. I, I tried all kinds of different things. Nothing was working. The statins brought them down. I wish I wasn't so scared of statins from the beginning. I would have taken them earlier, but doesn't matter. So semaglutides, I don't know what the long-term impacts of that will be. Um, I do know that again, it's, well, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. You know, we'll just see. 
And I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to talk. I'm not going to say shit. I don't know. hundred um, percent. Fixing the mindset. So important first. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm on fire. Must've been the moon. I think it was the moon. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. Curious how fast you gained 25 pounds and how long it took to take off. Um, I gained the 25 pounds, like, like probably five, six months. Um, how fast I take it off. I don't know how quick I took it off. It was relatively quick. You know, that's a true thing. I will say, I, I will tell you a theory that I can't explain scientifically. Now I will tell you, I've had this theory for a while and the longer I'm around more scientific discoveries kind of come around that explain it. So let me, let me go into this. I do think our body has a set. I, I think we, we have a set point. I believe in a set point that I think is primarily mental. I think your self-image now, you think of yourself as your primary weight set point. I think you think of yourself as an overweight person. You live and eat like an overweight person and you are an overweight person. So I think you need to change your self-image. Okay. That being said, I also think there is a physical set point. That set point is just a phrase used to describe, in my world now, your microbiome, your hormones, right? Your GLP-1 production, um, your ghrelin, leptin resistance production. Um, there are hormones that, that affect your weight set point. It's very rarely like your metabolism, like how fast or slowly you burn calories. That has a very small impact on your weight, okay? So the idea of fast metabolism being, oh, a person can eat 5,000 calories and burn you know, 4,000 of them, you know, unless you're like Michael Phelps, the swimmer who was working out all day long, you're like an athlete, your fast, slow metabolism accounts for very, very little bit of, of what your weight is. But think about your metabolism in a deeper way in terms of your hunger signaling, your satiety signaling, um, these types of things that seems to be more of it, meaning that it's not like you could eat the same amount of food and then just burn the calories. It's that your body is triggering you to eat more. Okay. So this does happen. I do think we have a physical set point that changes to some degree. Now I know they did the biggest loser study and said, that doesn't change your leptin resistance and your leptin signal is affected forever. I don't buy into that study. I don't give a shit. I'm always seeing that biggest loser study. And I think that's an outlier. I think the way that they lost the weight's weird. Um, it's too fast. It's not, it's not a good thing to, to base everything on. Okay. That being said, I do think that for me, like I, I'm say, say I'm at my goal weight and then I put 25 pounds on, it's easier for me to drop that 25 pounds than it would be for someone who's 50 pounds overweight to drop 25 pounds. Okay. It's easier for all these factors. Some of it's mental, some of it's physiological, some of it's microbiome. Microbiome stuff is fascinating. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into it here, but again, I believe, and I know for a fact I could overeat a bit and my body will protect me for a little while. Okay. This is part of what got me into the problem of the 25 pounds. I could start eating more for the next two, four weeks, and I may not see that much of a weight gain, but then the weight stay, the weight starts coming on. And I think the same thing happens with people that are overweight. They start cutting their calories down, living healthier, and they don't get much of a result for two, four, six weeks but then the weight loss starts happening. And I think it's a number of these factors. Um, and I think a lot of it's microbiome. I'll tell you a real quick microbiome stuff. This is a relatively new science. Microbiome, you have more cells in your body that are non-human than human. Um, what's really digesting your food are the microbes in your gut. And you have, we can have different microbe communities. This is your microbiome. So if you eat a high sugar, high processed food diet, you're gonna have a different type of microbiome than if you eat a natural whole food diet, okay? And again, the microbiome science is pretty new. They've known about the gut microbes for a long time. They did not realize there's all different kinds and they didn't know that until they started genetically testing them. And now they realize there's different makeups of microbiome. And so now we have to move on to mice experiments with microbiome because it's relatively new with humans. But with mice, they have obese mice and thin mice and if they transplant a thin mouse's microbiome into the obese mice's body, they can feed the, my, the overweight mouse the same amount of calories it's been getting and it'll start to lose weight because the thin microbiome say is absorbing 70% of the calories where the obese microbiome is absorbing 95% of the calories, okay? So how much does this translate to humans? We don't know yet, okay? So this is mouse science at this point. 
Um, now they do do, and again, the way we transplant microbiomes is fecal transplants, okay? Um, so they do this with humans to some degree, not necessarily for weight loss yet, but for some different physical um, you know, situations. But anyways, the point I'm trying to say is that I do believe that we can transform a microbiome pretty quick by how we live and how we eat. And so if you start to create a microbiome, well, if you start eating more healthy, natural, whole foods, you're going to create a different microbiome. The more fiber you eat, fiber is like superfood for your microbiome, for the good micro microbes. And so the more healthy you're eating, the more healthy your microbiome is. And that supports everything because your microbiome, they call it the second genome. It has such an impact on you. In a weird way, if you got a sugar-based microbiome, your microbiome is urging you to eat more sugar. It's craving those things, right? And if you eat a natural, if you have a natural food microbiome, it's encouraging you to eat healthier food. So again, we could go into intricate depths with this whole conversation. I don't want to get into that right now, but just the real simple thing, and it sounds very unscientific when I say it, is that I believe there are these physical set points that do change. And then when you've been at your weight for a while, you, there is some, some set point effects of it, but they're not permanent. There's no person, as far as I can tell, there's no person on the planet that if you consistently cut their calories down to a low dose, they're going to fucking lose weight. Okay. Again, if you look at famine situations over history, you don't see any outliers in those situations. You don't see an obese person, an overweight person in a famine situation, do you? If you do, let me know. There's always outliers. So I wouldn't be surprised there was one picture with someone like that, but th there is thermal dynamic. There, there is, you know what I mean? Like physics going on. There are laws of physics in the world. Uh, anyways, um, Chuck says, you're great because you're passionate for weight mastery is insane. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's, it is insane. I am more obsessed with weight mastery than probably, uh, there's, I don't know anyone. <laughs> I am, I've been obsessed with this my whole life, honestly. Um, obviously my dad died. I knew it was weight related then. My journey, um, there was things that happened before my dad that I've been obsessed with it forever. And, um, and now here, this is what I do for a living. It, it's crazy. You know, I will tell you, it, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very thankful for your podcast. Listen to them is feel reprogram my subconscious mind. Absolutely, Rena. It definitely is. Um, ah, you're handsome. Thank you. Uh, Bree says, love the hypnosis sessions. Just curious why I only relax the upper half of the body. I feel uneven. Okay, Bree, I get that. I do that simply because of a time thing. You know, again, they're, they're five minute sessions, so I got to move them along quickly. Um, but remember, Bree, there, there are full sessions in the library. Go listen to those because a lot of those I'm, I'm doing the entire body. When I work with people, I usually do the whole body. But yeah, the upper part is typically where we store more of our stress. So if we get this, again, it's just kind of bang for your buck. You know, you're getting the most return on investment of, of you know, changing waste up stuff. But that's funny you say that. Uh, are you single? No, I am married. I am married. I'm the same woman since I've been 16. Um, there's different energy since the eclipse. <laughs> sure, I could see that. That eclipse was cool. Um, Faith, after a bad day, I love to eat an unhealthy meal. Yeah, sure, right? I appreciate you saying that out loud, okay? Uh, yeah, a lot of times when we feel stressed, frustrated, whatever, um, we go, because why, right? You feel like shit. What's the easiest way in our society, right? If you don't love doing drugs or, or drinking alcohol or gambling, um, you know, what's the easiest way to change how you feel? Eat something. You know, again, we've been conditioned in society to use food as our main emotional management strategy. And so you have to find genuine ways to manage your emotions. So, yeah, a lot of people love eating a healthy meal after a bad day for sure. Haley says, do pump inhibitors impact on weight loss? Um, that's an interesting question that I haven't studied enough to, to be able to answer. Um, and again, it, it, it just, it depends, you know, we get into situations I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I, I don't have enough to, to answer that. So I'll just leave that. Do you think what you're saying is easier for men? Um, mm, uh, yeah, I, I, I do. My experience has been, yes, I think it's easier for men to lose weight than women. I do think that. Why? I think there's a lot of reasons for that too. But, um, but that being said, the majority of clients I've worked with over my career have been women in some phase of menopause that, you know, the, anyone that does the work and follows the process, they always lose weight. So I do think it's easier for men. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. 
But just because something's easier, though, does you know, hey, what, what can we do? You know what I mean? Like, so I do think it's easier. Um, I totally relate to what you said about the nylon avoid and the scale. Yeah, of course. Right. I mean, let's come on, folks. I always say this, you know, awareness precedes change and, you know, recognizing your own blind spots and what you go into denial about is so important, especially with weight, because I can't tell the number of people like I'm doing everything I can to lose weight. Nothing's working. And five seconds into the conversation, it's clear as day they're not doing everything they can, you know, and if you're living in that belief, it, it's such a blind spot, you know. So, yeah, being able to see through our own bullshit is, is really step number one of mastering your weight, you know? So interesting, like microbiome and it might make it take longer to start losing. Yeah, I, I totally think that's what, I think there's other things, but I, the microbiome, when I learned that, I will tell you like, like well, I don't believe that, but, but the microbiome thing I think is fascinating because a lot of people don't have any idea about this and it gives more context to why weight loss takes longer for some people. You know, that's one, one part of it. And it gives you more, once you understand that, now you can again engage in a more holistic, comprehensive approach to mastering your weight that involves not just cutting calories, but transforming the calories you're eating as well so that you're supporting a healthier microbiome and not through probiotics. You know, again, I just think I could be totally wrong on this. So take it for what it's well. I'm not an expert in this, but I think, you know, supplements, vitamins, probiotics, Metamucil. I, I think when you're trying to shortcut the system, it's not going to work. I think science is great, but I don't think they can explain everything. And so it's like, oh, well, here's the fiber. Yeah, but maybe there's more to it than just fiber. Maybe you can't just isolate the fiber and that's going to work. Maybe you need the whole thing. And so it makes a lot of sense to me because everything works out this way. I will tell you, I have learned about nutrition 30 years ago in a very non-scientific way, I would say. The raw food industry is not the most scientific people. Um, yoga, you know, health is not the most scientific, but they got their handle on something. And it's pretty obvious. Basically, when you eat food that we've been eating for millions of years, natural foods, fruits, fibers, vegetables, greens, beans, when you eat foods that are in their whole food form, you're probably going to be pretty good going on in here micronutrient wise, vitamin wise, mineral wise, microbiome wise, um, blood sugar wise, all of it. And, and I've consistently found that eating a natural food diet, you know, the, the science comes down like, oh, look at the microbiome. Oh, this, oh, GLP one. And like the science comes down. These are, these are the things science loves to like take one thing out and say, oh, this is it. That's what's happening with the semaglutides. Oh, GLP-1. Yeah, okay, keep eating your bullshit. I heard Oprah say this. Oh, now I can just eat half the bagel instead of the whole bagel. And again, I have nothing wrong with bagels, but hey, don't eat fucking bagels every day. Even if you do want to eat this stuff, it's spiking your blood sugar still. And so again, we live in a society that wants to just deal with the symptoms and not deal with the core problem. And so you have to recognize that and, and move past it if you really want to master this area of your life. And the, the way you master your weight, you're never going to believe this. You got to eat more whole natural foods. If you're really going to master it, you know, uh, anyways, <laughs> Drolly says awesome live. Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Um, microbiome explains why my sugar cravings are way down after switching treats to pleasure days only. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, the pleasure clean days. I'm telling you that is, uh, that's really dawning on me that that is a profound thing I've come up with. <laughs> I don't know. I should be more humble, I suppose. Hannah, I'm ready to get to get the help visiting your website today. Time to get my mind right. All right, Hannah, let's see. I can't wait to see you in the program. Um, if you can do it, get the coaching, okay? Let's work together. I'll help you a lot more that way. Um, do you believe in calorie counting? Uh, I believe in whatever works for you. If you love counting calories, if you're like an accountant type of person who loves numbers and loves counting and tracking everything you put in your body, then great. If you don't like doing that, then I don't believe in calorie counting. Um, calorie counting is a very unnatural way to eat. Okay. We never did that in the history of the world. Um, but again, if you like to do it, do it. I don't mind calorie counting as a temporary thing you do to calibrate what you intuitively thought you were eating. I think tracking calories is great to say, oh, I thought that as many calories. Oh shit. It's twice as many as I thought. A lot of my, my path was this. I was like, I remember like, like Chinese food. I remember I used to think when I was a kid, kind of growing up, I was like, oh, Chinese food's really healthy. I don't know why I thought that I just did. And then I found out not the healthiest. You know, it depends what you get to some degree, a lot of oil and, and, and the way the foods they're serving you there is not the way they eat in China. Um, and that's the way it is for a lot of foods. I'll tell you something I found that was interesting. The restaurants we go to, especially when it's ethnic food, it's usually celebration foods from those countries. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, we did American food before everyone thinks American food, like fast food now. 
But um, it would be like if if American food in other countries was like Thanksgiving Day dinner, right? And they're like, oh shit, that's how they eat every day. So a lot of foods from other countries, it's like celebration meals. And so we've been, you know, trained to think that that's normal and all the rest of it. But but anyway, so as you, I think tracking calories is good as a calibration tool just to see where you're at. But I like to set my eating up so it's more kind of intuitive and structured. So I don't have to track calories or measure things or count things. Um, I want to make my I want to make my eating as automatic as possible and tracking calories is not automatic. Weighing calories is not automatic. It's a lot more work. So I want to make it as easy and automatic as possible. Um, do you speak Greek? I do not. I do not speak Greek. Uh, Karen, what about genetics families that don't have the same lifestyle, but seem to all be obese? Um, yeah, there's de definitely a genetic factor, no doubt about it. So when I talk about famine situation, there's no overweight, obese people, um, that is an outlier event. Okay. And so when you look at the population, absolutely genetics play a factor. There's no question about it. Um, how much of a factor they play is always up for debate. There's a great saying I love that genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. I'm a big believer in that statement. That being said, um, there are some people that will probably never be able to weigh what I weigh just genetically. Okay. That does seem true. And so that brings me to the conversation of to master your weight, you need two things. You need action and acceptance. So you definitely, most people can take action to lose weight, but at some point you got to get to the point where you accept what you weigh and everyone's different. So some people, you know, if I had different genetics, maybe it would be harder for me to weigh what I weigh now. Now, this is a tricky line though, because I will tell you, uh, everyone in my family was overweight. You know, I remember my mom, she's like, oh, you're thin now, but wait till you get older, wait till you get older, wait till you get older. Well, she was right. I started getting older, I started putting the weight on. And so, and she was, she struggled with the weight and my dad was overweight. And so you start to think like, oh shit, is that genetics or was it lifestyle? And the genetics is, is a big conversation. So again, I don't want to get into the, all the details of that right now, but genetics do play a factor. There's no question about it. But genetics are very interesting because genetics, you're not just born with genetics. There's a, a study, a field of study called epigenetics. A lot of our genetics, we can, we can activate or deactivate based on what we eat and our lifestyle. So again, that's why program yourself then is a holistic comprehensive approach to mastering your weight. And part of that is to flip the switches that support your genetics and your, your weight mastery as well. So that's kind of a, a long, necessarily answer. Oh, toasted bagel, cream cheese. Oh, it's not bad. No bagels. And you can eat bagels, by the way. I eat bagels, but I eat them moderately. Would I like to eat a bagel every day? Yes. I love bagels. I'm one of the few people, as you know, that would go to the bagel bakery and get a bagel sandwich and then get a cinnamon raisin bagel just to eat as a dessert, just to chase it down. I love bread. I love bread. Um, but I love being at my goal weight and healthy more. And so I master my bagel intake and I moderate it so that I'm able to eat bagels and weigh what I want at the same time. So anyways. Um, um, <laughs> so true. Yeah, Oprah has personal chefs too. Exactly. Um, what's a pleasure day? A pleasure day is when you eat for pleasure. So we have clean days where we're eating for fuel and we have pleasure days where we're eating for pleasure. How can you get the most pleasure out of food? And I know you're freaking out. You know, I need everything in sight. Well, then you'll realize that's not the most pleasure because I feel like shit. Go eat as much as you can. Take the Eat everything you possibly want to eat one day and notice how shitty you feel at the end of that day. Well, that can't be the most pleasure then, right? Because when we feel the most pleasure, we don't feel like shit, okay? So where's the sweet spot where you eat what you want and you have the most pleasure for it? Well, you're going to have to moderate what you eat. Stuffing every fucking thing you can see into your mouth is not the most pleasure. You've got to stop thinking that. And you do think that, which is one of the beliefs that's making it hard for you to master your weight. Okay. But anyways, I, I don't have time to get out of here in a minute, but um, I don't have time to explain the pleasure day the way I want to. Again, what I will say to everyone is if you're not in my world, go to my bio, click the link, sign up and get the free hypnosis session I give you, the free video training I made you, three steps to master your weight, Read the free emails I send you. They'll kind of get you this whole idea. And um, yeah, it, it'll explain a lot of what I'm talking about. Uh, examples of celebration meals. Um, yeah, pretty much whatever. You, I, I forget I, I forget who was talking about. Some, some top chef lady was talking about this, how a lot of the foods are like, you know, they're big deals, right? We, we don't eat like that normally in the, these different countries. But 
If it's normal, what about so smelly? What can I do to, to help that? If it's normal, what about so smelly? I'm not sure what that means. Um, I love bread too, unless it's bagels. Yeah, what's smelly, right? We're all wondering that. Um, Deanna says, is it good to look at calories though from time to time? Because at times it is surprising. Like I just realized macadamia nuts have double the calories and fat as almonds. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me be clear, Deanna. Um, nutritional literacy, a thousand percent. You You need to become nutritionally literate and fluent to master your weight. Okay. But that's different than tracking calories. There's a crossover there though, that, that sometimes if we track calories for a week or so, um, just to kind of get a handle on what we thought and what's real is valuable, but we've got to be nutritionally literate. Meaning a lot of times, like starting right now, if you want to lose weight, you don't have to change all your eating, but you've got to start reading labels and get a sense of how many calories and what you're eating because it'll be an eye opener. I, I see this all the time. If you think you're eating 100 calories, but you're eating 400 calories, you're fucked because you think you're doing everything right. And then you start to develop the belief in your head, no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. That's I, I've never seen that be true. But if you don't know how many calories and what you're eating, you won't know. So yeah, understand nutritional literacy is absolutely essential. Um, tracking calories is not. So I hope that helps. Um, why do I always quit? Probably because you don't have a real plan. You know what I mean? Everyone quits because they got stupid fucking plans. Keto's at the top of the list and you can put whatever you want. Weight Watchers is the same thing. I use keto because it's the most goofy. And so again, the idea that you're never going to need a carb again is, is so stupid. And so I don't know. I, again, I would like to, I would love to talk to someone the day before on a Sunday. Maybe I'll do a live on a Sunday coming up where I'll look for someone who's getting ready to start their keto plan and I will talk to them. I know John's not here, but John was like, they did a new year's day and he got, he stumbled onto my thing. He was about to start his keto intermittent fasting plan, heard me and signed up for the program instead. And, uh, he's happy he did obviously, but I would again, toasted bagel with cream cheese. I'd like to know your strategy to lose weight. And I, I know you enough to know that it's something <laughs> probably ridiculous. Don't take that personally. Um, like keto, I'm going to cut all the carbs out. Um, yeah, yeah. Diet on Monday, restart diet Sunday. Exactly. And what's the diet though? You know what I mean? What's the diet? You know, I'm sure it's something strict. It's some cut half the calories out, stop eating carbs, no more sugar. I'm going to track every calorie. I'm going to count every point. It doesn't matter. Whatever diet you think you want to do, well, bring it up and I'll tell you why it's stupid. Um, it's just, it's goofy. And so the idea that you're going to just stop eating carbs tomorrow, I, again, I can't say this enough, but if you've been struggling to, you've been struggling with your eating for decades, but then tomorrow you're going to be a complete and total master of it. What the fuck world are you living in that you think you can do that? How, how's that possible? Unless you got a brain transplant overnight, then we'll see what happens. Same brain that struggled with, with eating for 30 years is tomorrow going to magically be a perfect eater. Huh? What, what? You have to explain how that works to me. Someone has to explain that to me. I ask every day. No one ever explains it to me, but I would love to know, you know? Um, so anyways. Oh, I get gas, Jim. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you get gas when you eat more fiber and all the rest of it. Um, usually I will tell you, yeah, if you start eating more fiber, I started eating more fiber. And for a couple of weeks, my stomach felt like shit. I felt like someone poured concrete in my intestines, but then I just, you get used, you don't get used to it. You, you, it normalizes and then you feel fine. Your body, it just takes a little bit. It's a microbiome transformation. And so it feels weird and you might fart a bit for a little while. Who cares? You know, it's like, um, you, you'll get used to it. So I, I always want you to understand that, that when you first make changes, it's a little bit rocky and then it, you normalize to it. Okay. And so, um, yeah, the gas, the discomfort, the taste bland, it's not that good. That all normalizes. You just, you get used to stuff. Your body adapts to it, you know? Um, yeah. So toast to be able to track all the calories. There you go. Yeah. It's hard because homemade food I can't track. So I say, fuck this and quit. Yeah, exactly. Even if it wasn't homemade food, tracking every calorie sucks. And so every time you try to do something hard, you're always going to get to the point where you say, fuck it, I quit. Fuck it. I, I made a video on that, right? The, the, the phrase is, the mantra of weight struggling is, fuck it, I don't care. Screw this. I'm done. I can't do this, right? That, that's what you get to. So it's, it's, not, it's not you. It's the plan you're trying to follow. It's so stupid that you can't stick with it for more than a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And you keep blaming yourself. And that's the part I want you to internalize 
it's not your fault. It's like you've never been shown how to master your weight. So if you want to learn, go to my bio, click the link at hypnosis, watch the training, and I'll show you how. Um, thanks. And the long bowel movements have to make memes with them. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you remind me of my friend. Um, all right, everyone. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Go to my bio, do that stuff. Listen to the podcast. It's program yourself then. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're really serious, go to program yourself then and check out the program and get, get going with it. Um, but yeah, listen to the podcast. And if you like the podcast, leave me a review, leave me a review. It, it helps me out. All right, everyone have a super day and we'll talk soon. Bye.